God appears to have trusted and loved Enoch, the last of the patriarchs. Using our calculations, he became Metatron in 987 AA, years after Adam, and presided over the trial of the Nephilim. Jared was born in 460 AA, so the trouble they caused occurred between 460 AA and 987 AA, when the Nephilim descended. Noah's time was also marked by the descent of a second group which caused humanity many problems. Methuselah is not mentioned in any of the ancient documents, indicating he wasn't very popular despite the gods' trust in him as a priest-king. Neither was Lamech, for Methuselah passes the priesthood to Nier in the Slavonic Book of Enoch, bypassing Lamech's generation and, more critical, skipping Noah's generation. Lamech was like this. When Lamech was 182 years old, he gave birth to a son, Noah. He named him that because he would relieve us of the toil of our hands on the forbidden soil. As a result of Noah's birth, Lamech lived 595 years and begot sons and daughters. After his death, Lamech lived 777 years and begot sons and daughters. There is ambivalence in the scriptures regarding Lamech, torn between Cain's evildoer and Seth's laudable one. Despite the patriarch's prodigious lifespan, the total elapsed time corresponds to only 1,656 years according to Genesis's chronology. This chronology suggests that Adam and Cain were the first to die in 930 and 931 AA respectively, when Lamech was born in 874 AA. It is likely that the events of Jared's time, when the Nephilim first descended, through the generations of Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah up to the deluge were not more than 700 or 800 years. It is believed that Lamech and Methuselah died during the deluge since their lifespans ended simultaneously. Despite being the longest lived of the patriarchs, 969 years, little is known about Methuselah. It is believed that he gained his knowledge from the works of Berossus and Polyhistor which are attributed to the Greek writer Eupolemus in Pseudo-Eupolemus. According to Eupolemus, Methuselah acquired knowledge from the angels and passed it on to mankind. This may be a reference to the knowledge passed to Enoch's family by Enoch on his first return to Earth. A spaceship and Earth must have been open to Methuselah, just as they were to Enoch. The Dead Sea Scrolls tell a story about Lamech being concerned about his son Noah's strange appearance and asking Methuselah to see Enoch for an explanation. As Methuselah orbited Enoch in his spacecraft, he apparently had no problem reaching him. The coming catastrophe was also warned to Methuselah. Enoch's Slavonic version reveals that 200 years before the event, he was warned that destruction is drawing near. He was also instructed to summon Nier, the second son of Lamech, and brief him on the coming disaster. And then I will preserve the son of your son Lamech, his first, Noah. The scriptures mention Methuselah's grandson Noah as the hero of the deluge, but there are few references to his second grandson Nier, the son of Lamech, nor to Nier's son Melchizedek. According to the tradition of the patriarchs, they are both priest kings, after instructing his son Methuselah, Enoch returned to the spaceship. He was given the priesthood. Darkness fell over the earth. Nia's wife, Soponim, who had been sterile until then, conceived a child at this time. Nia and no other man had slept with her, which suggests that the father was probably a Nephilim. She was banished from Nia's sight when he was not convinced of her innocence. He visited her shortly before she gave birth. Suddenly, she died at his feet. While they prepared her burial, they wrapped her in burial garments and placed her on the bed. The surprise of their lives awaited them when they returned home. Several years later, Soponim gave birth to a child whose name is Slavonic Enoch. As Noah and Nier came to bury Soponim, they saw the child sitting beside the dead Soponim wiping his clothes as he sat beside her. Due to the child's full physical development, Noah and Nier were very terrified with great fear. 
A blessing was spoken by him with his lips. His badge of priesthood was on his chest, and its appearance was glorious. Noah and Nir stared at him. The child was dressed in priestly garments and named Melchizedek by Noah and Nir. The badge of priesthood he wore on his chest, which distinguished him as part divine, was none other than the mark of the Nephilim, probably a patch of the lustrous scaly hide. Nir suggested that the child's presence be hidden from the people since they wouldn't understand and would kill him. One of the demigods in the Mahabharata is Kana, born of the sun god Surya and an earth mother. A coat of armor covers him as if he were a divine being. The Hindu classics also mention the scaly skin patch as a sign of divinity. To obtain a sophisticated weapon, Kana makes a pact with the gods. After accepting the celestial weapon, Kana begins to keep his end of the bargain. With sharp tools, he begins removing his armor. The gods and mortals applauded Kana for cutting off a part of his body without showing any pain or leaving any scars. Kana's father may have been Melchizedek, just as the Hindu sun god was Kana's father. Adonizedek, called Melchizedek, Joshua 10, means my lord is Zedek. Zedek is the Hebrew name for the Roman sun god Jupiter. Noah also carried the mark of the Nephilim, as we will see. Then Nir learned that humanity would soon be wiped out by a great catastrophe, but Melchizedek would not die. He was taken to his new home, the ship orbiting the earth, by a messenger who said, When the people learn about the child, they will seize him and kill him. Aaron, brother of Moses, inherits the priesthood of Melchizedek in the Old Testament, later replaced by the Levites or tribe of Levi. Melchizedek's priesthood was preserved by the Mormons, who gave it precedence over all other priesthoods. Melchizedek priesthood is the higher priesthood of the Mormon Church, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There is less importance given to Aaron and Levi since the Aaronic priesthood is the lesser priesthood, which includes the Levitical priesthood. A high priest named Melchizedek, who served in the days of Abraham, later Jerusalem, and paid a tithe of 10% to Abraham, is the source of the Melchizedek priesthood, according to the Book of Mormon. According to Genesis, Noah found favor with the Lord. Noah walked with God because he was a righteous man. Enoch was the only patriarch who walked with God during his lifetime. Utnapishtim, Noah's Sumerian counterpart, was immortal and sent to live with the gods despite not being deified or made divine in the religious literature. Noah was not immortalized by the Hebrew priesthood for some reason. Noah was physically different from his nephew Melchizedek. Noah was born so physically different when he was born that, According to the Lost Book of Lamech, Lamech appealed to his father, Methuselah, who then asked Enoch whether Noah had been conceived by the Nephilim. According to Methuselah, Noah was not a divine being, but a son of Lamech. Why was Lamech so disturbed by this physical difference? Noah and his sons must have been confounded by this difference after the deluge. Genesis 9 made much of Noah's drunken stupor after the deluge when he collapsed in his tent because of too much wine. Ham saw his father naked and told his two brothers, who returned with a cloth and covered Noah. Noah loses all sense of reason after discovering that his son Ham had seen him naked and curses him and his son Canaan. There is something irrational about this reaction. Was Noah hiding his reptilian past because he wanted to erase it? A strip of scaly skin or hide on Noah's chest may have been the sign of the Nephilim, as with his nephew Melchizedek. Just before the deluge, human relations with the Nephilim had become so strained that open warfare broke out and any traces of reptilian ancestry were considered a badge of shame. To prevent the people from killing Melchizedek, the deity whisked him away. Levantine lands were inhabited by semi-divine warriors after the deluge. It appears they were installed at the beginning of the 3rd millennium BC as the protectors of the western lands and space facilities, 
known as the Rephaim. The kings of Mesopotamia at that time, particularly Nanar Struk Sin, were their legitimate overlords. In the 21st century BC, when eastern kings invaded Transjordan, the Rephaim lost all fealty to legitimate authority and became independent martial forces in the western lands. For the next thousand years, they dominated and plagued the people of these lands as uncontrollable force. From Egypt to Anatolia, the Rephaim built impregnable glasses-type fortifications in the Levant. Under the biblical name Amalekites, their descendants, the Hyksos, occupied Egypt for over 400 years and prevented the Hebrew tribes under Moses from entering the land of Canaan. From the days of Abraham until the days of Solomon, the Rephaim's history is interwoven with the fate of the Hebrews. During the period known as the Judges, they controlled lands settled by the Hebrew tribes under various regional names such as Amarkim and Philistine. The Judean kings Saul and David, along with Carmose and Amose, the first kings of the Egyptian 18th dynasty, finally destroyed them as a political and military force. At Rosh Shamra, a few miles north of Latakia on the Syrian coast, archaeologists discovered a library of clay tablets dating from the 15th to 12th century BC. Ugarit, an ancient city on the trade route from northern Mesopotamia to the Mediterranean, was found at this site. The fate of the Hebrews is intertwined with the history of the Rephaim from the days of Abraham to those of Solomon. They controlled lands settled by Hebrew tribes under various regional names, such as Anakim and Philistine, during the Judges' period. They were finally destroyed as a political and military force by Saul and David, the Judean kings, and Kamose and Amose, the first kings of the Egyptian 18th dynasty. At Rosh Shamra on the Syrian coast, a few miles north of the modern city of Latakia, archaeologists discovered a library of clay tablets dating to the 15th to 12th century BC. This site is home to Ugarit, an ancient city on a trade route connecting northern Mesopotamia to the Mediterranean. The noted biblical scholar Adrian Curtis suggests three categories of Rephaim of the Ugarit tablets in his book, Ugarit, Rosh Shamra. Arpians are the elite charioteers who attended the banquet, the Rephaim of the earth. The Rephaim of old, also known as the royal family's ancestors or Ipin Kidim, antediluvian Nephilim were probably responsible for them, Elim. Rephaim is God, also known as Apm Ilnim, or Heaven's Rephaim. Perhaps these are the Anunnaki who remained in the spaceship sometimes called the Igigi. Our research here concerns the Rephaim of the Earth. As a semi-divine race of professional warriors, they were assigned to protect the Western lands. A native people of Canaan in the 3rd millennium BC, the Rephaim first appear in Genesis 15 when they are listed as one of Abraham's tribes. As Yahweh concluded his covenant with Abraham at Hebron in 2068 BC, he catalogued the people of the land as follows. From the river Egypt to the great river Euphrates, I give this land to your offspring, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonium, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. A major nation of the land is the Rephaim at this time. The seven nations of Canaan are listed in Deuteronomy 7 as the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites 600 years after the Exodus. There is a conspicuous absence of the Rephaim. In the intervening years, the nation or cohesive political force was destroyed. In the days of Abraham, Many of the Rephaim and their cities of Transjordan were destroyed. As a scattered people, the Anakim, Amalekites, and Philistines remained a powerful force in western and southern Palestine and were known by various local names. With their superior iron weapons and chariots, 
The Rephaim dominated the western lands for 2,000 years with their descendants, the Nephilim. It was virtually impossible to attack fortress cities. When Moses sent scouts north to reconnoiter the Canaan land before attempting extreme penetration, they were described as giants in the Book of Numbers. Reports from the twelve scouts were very pessimistic. After going into the Negeb, they came to Hebron, where the Anakites lived. There is a noticeable characteristic of this country in that its inhabitants are powerful and the cities are fortified and quite large. In addition, we also saw the Anakites living there. All the people we saw in it were men of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The Anakites are part of the Nephilim, and we looked like grasshoppers to ourselves. So we must have appeared to them as grasshoppers to them. The Israelites re-encountered the Anakites forty years later as they attempted to enter Canaan through Transjordan. The Moabites warned them not to harass or engage in war with them as they skirted the land of Moab. Like the Anakites, the Emin inhabited this land, but the Moabites called them Emin. Like the Anakites, they are referred to as Rephaim. The Anakim or Anakites are equated with the Nephilim and the Rephaim before and after the Deluge, respectively. Rephaim and their cousins were fierce warriors, giants in stature, equipped with iron weapons and war chariots. About five to ten years ago, the average Western Lands resident was about five years old. Nine and ten foot, three meters, Rephaim, must have been an imposing sight, standing at about 5.5 feet, about 1.5 meters. The Israelite reconnaissance team reported to Moses that the Anakim they had seen were giants. To them, they were like grasshoppers. The length of a man's forearm was measured in a cubit, which varied slightly among ancient peoples. A colossal man with a bedstead nine cubits long and four comprehensive was described as King Og of Bashan, reportedly the last of the Rephaim in that region. The bedstead measures 13.5 feet by 6 feet, 4.15 by 1.85 meters, based on a cubit of 18 inches, 45.54 centimeters. It would measure 11 by 5 feet, 3.38 by 1.54 meters, if measured by a cubit of 15 inches, 38 centimeters. The height of the Philistine Goliath, who defeated David, is described in the scriptures as six cubits and one span. Depending on the size of the cubit, he would be 10 or 8 feet tall, 2.46 to 3.08 meters. In Hebrew, Goliath and his brothers were known as Rephaim, although they were traditionally referred to as giants. Samson, the famous Rephaim, was probably also one. Old Testament writers mention his extraordinary accomplishments, but not his size. Nevertheless, he is called a giant in the Haggadah. Shemesh means sun or Shamash in Hebrew, and he was born near Beth Shemesh in Lebanon. Samson chose a Philistine woman over a Hebrew, presumably because she was a Rephaim. The demigod, Yahweh's envoy, according to tradition, impregnated his mother. His exploits in Judges 14 sound like those of the Rephaim at Ugarit. He was undoubtedly repeating the exploits of his ancestors at Ugarit when he staged a party at Timnah, a town near Beth Shemesh, for seven days. In the 4th and 3rd millennia, the Mesopotamian gods met and feasted in Baalbek, or Beth Shemesh, Samson's home. The Rephaim were formidable warriors. They outclassed their opponents with a variety of iron weapons. The sizable composite bow they used was said to be outraged by any other bow. They terrorized the countryside with iron chariots in the 2nd millennium. They often burst forth from these citadels and ravaged the surrounding countryside from their glasses-type fortifications, making their cities invulnerable. In the Transjordan, the Rephaim fortifications were strategically located along the King's Highway to protect their lands from the north, east, and south. Following the glasses-type design, they built newly fortified cities in the west. They broke their loyalty to established authority in 2085 BC 
when the eastern kings invaded and destroyed these fortified cities. Under their geographical location and tribal affiliations, this military class was known by various names in the Old Testament. The Moabites called them Emin, the Ammonites named them Zamzumin, and the Negebites called them Avim. In addition to occupying Lebanon and Mount Hermon, they built fortified cities in coastal Syria and Transjordan. In the western part of Palestine, the Philistines and Phoenicians allied and intermarried with the Kaftorim, who had come over from Crete. Anakims and Anakites, named after their ancestor Anak, lived among the natives. They became Amalekites, descendants of Amalek, when they settled in the Negev and Seir area. The capital of their nation was Hebron. During the Exodus, these plagues became a scourge on the Hebrews. A city with an ancient history, Jericho has been discovered through excavations. From circa 8000 BC until about 1500 BC, it was continuously occupied with occasional interruptions and destructions until it was destroyed, never to be rebuilt. The Bronze Age is the period we are concerned with here. From about 3200 BC until about 2200 BC, Jericho flourished, then suddenly ceased to exist. This strongly fortified city was destroyed by intense heat, so intense that its brick walls were reddened right through the center. After 2000 BC, a new type of fortification was introduced here, the glasses or scarp type. Apart from Jericho, this defense system can also be found in Palestine, northern Syria, and even in the delta of Egypt. Hyksos are usually credited with their invention. Stone walls and moats surround a steeply sloping scarp of soil covered with brick, tile, or plaster. Another wall is found at the top of the sloping scarp or glasses. Reconstructions of Jericho's defenses show a stone revetment 10 feet in height and a plaster slope at a 35 degree angle rising 35 feet 10.77 meters above the revetment. At its crest is a high brick wall which stands 65 feet 20 meters from the stone wall at its bottom. Its formidable appearance is revealed in a cross-section of the defense fortification. In the west, many cities were defended this way after 2000 BC. All these cities were united by a common culture or organization. The Rephaim were known for their military engineering genius, which was their common bond. Bethshean, Shechem, Gezer, Megiddo, Hazor, Sarahen, and many other Palestinian cities used this defense. In Anatolia and northern Syria, they can also be found at Alalach, Kashemish, and Ugarit. In the delta region of Egypt, they are also found. Transjordan, where fortified cities were built along the main north-south road, the King's Highway, is not known to have had glasses defenses, though an influential civilization flourished between the 23rd and 22nd centuries. It took a thousand years to rebuild these cities after they were destroyed at that time. Having learned from this experience, these Rephaim rebuilt their cities so that such wholesale destruction would not happen again. Additionally, they abandoned their loyalty to the Sumerian kings, resisted established authority, and roamed the lands as armed warrior bands. As the feudal system crumbled and terrorized northern France, the roving knights of the 14th century AD lost all fealty. In the 19th through 11th centuries BC, the Anarchim terrorized the surrounding land from behind their impregnable glasses-type defenses. The Book of Judges describes these forays. After ravaging the countryside and plundering at will, chariots left their citadels and ravaged the countryside. Efforts at resistance were immediately crushed. They reinforced their dominance over the land by controlling the production and use of iron. According to the first book of Samuel, there were no smiths in Israel, and the Philistines and their allies, the Kenites, who were skilled in metal smithing, repaired metal tools such as plowshares and sickles. For centuries, the Rephaim controlled the lands of Egypt and Palestine. In 2085 BC, 
Mesopotamian kings invaded Palestine via Damascus and followed the king's highway south to Elath on the Gulf of Aqaba. Taking this route led them up against the Rephaim citadels, a sort of Maginot line that protected Palestine from such incursions along the Transjordan. According to the Haggadah, there were 800,000 invading kings, and their power must have been overwhelming, as they did not only crush these fortified cities, but never rebuilt them, and the land remained vacant for a thousand years. According to Genesis, they followed the following route. Their first victory was at Ashtaroth Karnaim in the Transjordan, where they entered from the north. In a southerly direction, they swam west, destroying the Zuzim at Ham, which protected the crossroads from Megiddo to the sea. In southern Transjordan, they defeated the Emin at Shave Kiryataim. After successfully penetrating the Araba, they swung to Kadesh to destroy the Amalekites. Genesis mentions only a few cities, but there are probably many more that were destroyed. Six hundred years later, the Israelites were given a route by the biblical account that identifies these people. In this period, they surrounded Palestine to enter the Jordan Valley via the same route as the invading kings, but from the south. The Rephaim inhabited Ammon formerly, and they were taller and more numerous than the Anakites. The nation had been eliminated earlier, and the Ammonites had reoccupied the land. Zuzim and Zamzumin are the same people in Genesis and Deuteronomy. According to Jewish Midrashic literature, Zamzumins are the offspring of an alliance between Canaanite women and Nephilim. Deuteronomy also refers to the Emin. According to Moab, it used to be inhabited by the Emin, people great and numerous, as tall as the Anakites. Like the Anakites, they are called Rephaim, but the Moabites called them Emin. Consequently, the day is coming when the Philistines will be destroyed, and Tyre and Sidon will be without helpers. Because the Lord is destroying the Philistines, the remnant of Kaftor's coastland. Baldness has come upon Gaza, and Ashkelon has perished. How long will you gash yourself, remnants of the Anakim? Abraham and his family settled near Beersheba after Sodom and other cities in the Valley of Sidim were destroyed. They needed to pay homage to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, who apparently ruled the area at the time. Abraham lived in the western hill country when the Philistines occupied it. To live there, Abraham had to obtain land rights and permission from the landowner. In the aftermath of the pact, Abimelech and Phicol, chief of his troops, left and returned to Philistine territory. It is evident from this statement that even though the Philistines did not live here, they controlled the land. Abimelech's chief of troops appeared to indicate that they had a large military force on hand to enforce their claims. During natural disasters that spoiled the end of the Middle Kingdom in Egypt, the exodus is believed to have occurred in the 15th century BC. During this time of chaos, Moses led a ragtag army of refugees out of Egypt to reach Canaan. From their position in the Negev, the Amalekites could easily penetrate Egypt due to government and military power collapse. As the refugees under Moses attempted to enter Canaan, this force of professional warriors met them. They were also moving westward. After a pitched battle at Rephidim and several skirmishes, Moses was convinced they could not penetrate this formidable army. With a disintegrating government and disorganized army, the Amalekites, almost unopposed, occupied the delta of Egypt. Following their departure from Egypt, the Israelites entered the wilderness of Shur by the most direct route to Canaan. On the 15th of the second month, they camped at Rephidim. Amalekite hordes were encountered here. The battle with the Amalekites was only one of many. It was a costly victory for Moses, since they were hard-pressed and close to defeat. Deuteronomy 25 recounts how the descendants of the Rephaim harassed Moses' migrating force continuously. During your journey after you left Egypt, Amalek surprised you on the march when you were famished and weary, 
and cut down all the stragglers in your rear without fear of God. As a result of the ferocity of the Amalekites' attacks, Canaan's direct approach was sealed at Rephidim. Nevertheless, they were to be blocked once more before turning south and taking an indirect route into Palestine. 